Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jason Knight, and on each episode of this podcast, I'll be having inspiring conversations with passionate product people. If that sounds like the sort of thing you want a bit more of in your life, why not head over to onenightinproduct.com where you can sign up to the mailing list, subscribe on your favorite podcast app, or follow the podcast on social media and guarantee you never miss another episode again. On tonight's episode, we talk about performance design and the importance of having teams of pioneers, settlers, and town planners to balance blue sky thinking and good old-fashioned operationalization and scaling. We talk about what performance design is, why it's important, and the joy of building and executing through high-performing teams. We also ask whether designers and agile delivery can really work, and how to make sure we build a good bond between product, design, and engineering. For all this and much more, please join us on One Night in Product. So my guest tonight is Richie Loke. Richie's a New York history buff, board game collector and pioneer in the field of performance design. As a designer, Richie wants us to stop thinking about design as just pushing pixels, but as a strategic enabler in the art of visual problem solving. Richie's currently solving those problems as the VP of product design and services at Wonderkind, a one-to-one performance engine and the world's first marketing operating system. Let's hope he's installed all the updates. Hi, Richie. How are you tonight? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Jason. And hello to your listeners. Yeah, well, um, if they were here right now, they would be saying hello right back at you. So first things first, Wonderkind, I've seen all those lovely words about what Wonderkind does, but specifically in, in as simple terms as you can describe to someone like me, what problem does Wonderkind specifically solve? Yeah, it's the simplest way I would say it is we uniquely have ways of connecting brands with customers, the end customer. There's a client in between there that usually we work with and they'd sign us and such, but... <laughs> Whether it's, uh, you know, if you're thinking just about retail and uh, e-commerce, you know, those brands have those mechanisms and we find those customers for them, the right customers, the right time for the right thing and try to just increase that performance of that. It's quite honestly, very much like if any of your listeners have done retail, I worked at the mall and sold shoes, (laughs) knowing them a little bit better. It's caring about them a little bit more and being more authentic in what your brand is and trying to just make sure you speak to your audience. And so... I think in that way, um, that's performance. It, it, it helps, it works, and it gives a better experience in what you're selling, what you're buying. And so it's as simple as that. We have a lot of digital solutions to that. In the future, we have to have non-digital solutions as well. So when you say digital solutions, you talk about the platforms that you're building to enable your clients to set that up themselves. I mean, my closest analogy here would be something like using Google Analytics or Google Tag Manager, like having stuff that I can set up via a platform that I can then embed on my site and it then does all the clever stuff for me. Is it that kind of deal or have I completely got that wrong? Yes and no. I could go into detail and talk about this all week, which I do. <laughs> we uniquely, and we will be poised to do less of this, we tend to be more of a white glove service where uh-huh. we believe there's so much of what, there's a huge landscape of tools and things out there that you can use and very few people have the time to learn them, to use them, to optimize them for what is, to actually get real value out of them. So my founder of this company and another founder and I worked at a menswear company called Bonobos historically and bought a lot of services. We bought a lot of tools and a lot of software, but how much money did you get out of it? Did you get that return on investment? A lot of times, no, because you don't have time. And so historically, we were steeped out of an idea where we'll do it for you and we'll guarantee those results and we'll try to just be a great partner. Now, that doesn't scale that well. Over time, we're, <laughs> we're moving that down. A little bit more where we can have customer input at different parts and different key points where they have different simple but powerful tools where they can do that quicker and faster for themselves. But generally, our bread and butter is that we do it for individuals better than they can do it for themselves. And they are very happy. So they don't have to and we make them more money. (laughs) But you're the VP of product design and services there. And you just touched a little bit about the services there. And that, I guess, is what we're calling that white glove kind of onboarding and white glove maintenance of their solutions. So when it comes to the product design part then, are you currently building tools more for your internal people to manage the stuff for the clients and then hopefully getting those tools to one day be client suitable? Or are they kind of client suitable already? Or like, how does that work? Good question. Both. Excellent. Historically, we built complex tools that do really powerful things that was very hard to learn, but we leveraged and used ourselves to do some pretty amazing things and make pride a lot of value and a lot of money. We'll continue doing that and finding opportunities to do that simpler and better. But there's definitely an opportunity for us to nail 
parts of that <laughs> complex services offering and give our clients more opportunity to do that themselves and to kind of feed the need of different users within the client base. There's many different people we expect would use our tool and our platform and they think differently and they need different tools. You can imagine the simplest thing would be like a copywriting tool and for a copywriter and doing that at one level to see and feel the strategy of a marketing strategy is very different than what a designer needs or a marketing manager to do things very strategically. That makes a lot of sense. But we chatted before this and you described yourself as a pioneer rather than a settler or a town planner. <laughs> now, we'll come back to settlers and town planners in a bit, but when you're saying that you're a pioneer, are you very much, or would you consider yourself very much up in the clouds doing all that blue sky, big thinking, or are you kind of in the weeds as well, getting involved in the detail or some mixture of the two? If you're asking about me as Richie, yes, I know what my value is and it is I have some pretty big ideas and I think at a scale and a scope and I understand with my founders and our product people and such like a long-term vision, you know, four or five years down the line of how we think we can generally see the future of how this could come together. I think there's incredible opportunity within what we're doing within a larger space that doesn't quite honestly exist yet. But I personally think the value that I drive is that I actually know how these things work. I really help. Uh, hands down to build our platform too. In the way that I knowing how you implement and how things actually work from an architecture and design and system standpoint, having firsthand knowledge of the services department, for instance, <laughs> allows me to have the insight of how I would do that differently and how I can have a big, you know, not just a half step forward, not incremental change, but like a, you know, a very, you know, sea change. So in that way, I think I'm steeped and I, as much as possible, I resisted being like a manager or an upper leadership because I felt that individual contributor allowed me to really have and understand the specificity of what is really powerful about what we did. And then I realized, well, at a certain point, there's people that are better at it than me. They can take it and iterate and get better. <laughs> so that's where the town's planner or the, you know, the different stages we talked about previously come in of finding the people that are better suited for that thing at scale so I can continue leveraging the next step, the next step and get and prepare them for that. Well, as long as you're not just sitting there proposing loads of things that people can't actually build, which is obviously what some blue sky thinkers <laughs> do. No, my hope is it's very steeped in, in our roadmap, right? Next steps in like a couple of years <laughs> down the line and it all connects. And it, if anything, it's like architecture. You know, you might have people that are in the architectural understanding, like how the system's going to function, how it's going to connect the ecosystem and such. So one thing that occurs to me, if you've kind of got that ability to operate at both levels or that background in the individual contribution and you know how all this stuff works is that it can be quite difficult to escape the gravity of like the planet of individual contribution that is like trying to drag you back to it because you know all this stuff and they want you to be doing all that day-to-day -day urgent not important stuff have you ever felt that gravity or are you quite good at blasting off and going out into space if we can talk to our analogies no, I think I think I, I wear many hats. I've been very fortunate in the way that I can build teams around these different stages or different things. And I think inevitably when you're good at and you get better at hiring, which I think I have, and you have good partners, those individuals can fulfill those needs better than I could in the first place. Right. And that's the greatest when you hire and you have a great team where they've done it better or more effectively with more detail and you can leverage that individual. That is the dream, right? Where you've done it yourself without doing anything. And I think that that's the beauty of like a good management system and more structure. And so I found that that became really rewarding later on when I realized there's better people than myself to have that specificity of, of implementation and understanding. And then as long as we have that trusted flow of communication up and down, I, I think that that's benefited both of us. So, But it's not a small company, according to LinkedIn, at least. It's got, I think, anywhere between 600 and 800 people, depending on which metric you look at. And obviously, you're there as the VP of Product Design and Services. You've got a bunch of other designers. You've got a bunch of product directors and a wider product team there that I dug out as well. And I guess it's not uncommon for there to be disconnects between, say, product and product design teams. Like, that's not an unknown dynamic, right? So how's the dynamic there between your team and the product team at Wonderkind? Like, have you managed to forge a fairly healthy relationship and diffuse some of those tensions that can occur? Yeah, I hope so. I think that dynamic is always changing, especially as we grow. I think different stages and different sizes of the company, you're, you're wearing different hats. I think when I've identified the value that the product design part of innovation and visioning, what we can, I, I dare I say, like cheaply conceive of things, document them, prepare them, and, and organize them in a way that a product manager or a product person probably doesn't have time to prepare them. And maybe... Oh, we're so busy. Yeah. In that way um, that I can make sense. And I think design, I use not just visual design, but like 
research and organizing that and putting that to paper is part of the thing that then will be incorporated into a product spec, right? Or a PRD or something like that. So those requirements really come out of that clarity. We have some great ideas from some big thinkers outside myself in this company and translating those ideas, putting the pen to paper a bit and making them persuasive and making a case for them. I think design does that better than anybody. And I think that there's a financial component that then comes in to make those decisions and from our, our biz ops teams and such, but to really describe such, especially what we do where there's layers of the customer experience and how it's going to connect with our product and how it's going to work and you put them together. Design does that really well. So that first stage of innovation and visioning, I think is crucial. And I think that as I partner better with the product team, they really appreciate that. And then the second stage around, we have a UX research, kind of that equivalent. That is a true partnership, right? Where we, they take then that further into detail and, and really kind of partner and get to the specificity of those different requirements. And then I think that third thing where they should, I expect, and I think most, I, I think good product people do really appreciate that when it comes back to design, that third stage of actual pixels and actual, like the rigor <laughs> of like the actual uh, UI, right? That, that then we can do that at a level that meets their specific spec that they wrote, right? And then handing it back. So I think that there's, there's a nice back and forth of if you have like a really strong, you know, triangle of engineering, product design and design, I wish th- that that becomes like three really different stages of looking at it. And so that fourth one to me is where design is really communicating to almost engineering for implementation, right? So those four stages, I think, happen in all different stages of, of our company. And we have four different wings to design. And in general, I think it's pretty consistent, whether it's producing those four stages of, of understanding on the, the design um, workflow. But you've said before that design is a problem-solving medium. And I'm assuming that means, and you've touched on it a little bit yourself, like you want your team or your designers or the designers up the funnel as far as possible, getting involved at the outset of any initiatives that are going on, rather than what happens in some companies where you just get some product manager throwing a grenade over the wall at the last minute, everything kind of signed, sealed and delivered. It's your job to, as you put it, push pixels and just design a UI that makes the PM look good. Yeah. So I guess the question is, like, if you're getting involved way up front, like, how do you weigh the amount of involvement that you would expect or need versus the amount of time that your teams need to actually do, well, the design? Well, for me, I just make clear they're different. They're not the same teams. They're, they tend to be like a little overlap. We have maybe it's more like a scrum situation, right? Maybe not true scrum, but no one uses true scrum, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there's one guy, he wrote that book. So early on, yeah, how much time to do and how much to put towards it? I think, yeah, I, I you know, I wish I had an answer to that. I think that it, it's, <laughs> it really is like by the feel of like how important things are and what the roadmap is and what we're working on. Yeah, I generally think the time pressure and in, in really good for me is I, one of my favorite colleagues, our uh, vice president of analytics and, and uh, data analytics has always told me, your best work's in 20 minutes. I don't know if my best work's in 20 minutes, but <laughs> quite truly, I could vision and organize a team around years of preparing and planning. We've had prepared and planned some things for years, but the, you know, ultimately you get the sweet spot of, you know, in one week or one quarter, I can get vast majority of that work done and get it off and not to be too worried about the detail. And that should be on product anyway. So. I think that that's kind of, to me, like the, just feeling that sweet spot of like the return, you know, it's ROI. But you just touched on Scrum as well. And I've certainly worked with designers in the past that really struggle with agile software development and how that intersects with design because some designers will be really wanting to get everything kind of designed just so and pixel perfect and implemented perfectly and really not have any concept of the fact that some designs might be hard to build or they might be hard to build in the time that people have got and start to get quite precious about their designs and and really struggle to go for this kind of constant two-week cycle. Is that something that you feel is getting better in design circles, like a designer's getting a lot more into agile development now, or is there still that kind of lingering idea that it's kind of incompatible, which is certainly a message that I've seen from some designers? I don't think I've cracked it, but I think I see it differently than I used to. I think in the way that, like we talked about those four stages, if those are slightly different teams or different responsibilities, we, if we have that big vision, and then the second stage is we have prepared like a broader visioning. I wouldn't say that's like the V1 version, but it's like the, not a blue sky, but like a, a simple but complete understanding of how it could work. And then you go back and you say, when these requirements, what's the V1, what's the V2? you know, whichever stage you're at of, of that, and then <laughs> pull back the, you know, pull back a little bit of the, the, the scale and scope of it. 
And then that, that fourth group, I have a team that's just at the features, right? That where they are we, with, living within the architecture in the ecosystem. They can say, well, we generally have this design system. We have this UI patterns and such. We, you know, we have that all built out with our front end team. And we can say, we can generally make th- them as the team. They, they can make general good decisions around that individual feature, that little workflow within the larger ecosystem. So I think that's kind of the, the way we've been working recently. And I think that's much better where it's like, you know, if that UI component libraries are baked out, so we can feel good about the consistency around the, that part of the user experience. And then we also know kind of where we're going towards and how it should all fit in. These smaller product specific features should fit within that ecosystem. And I, I would hope that, you know, we generally have like a design architect that kind of sees things through at a different scale that that should all fit together. And I think the product people really want to think like that as well. I, I think, right. Well, maybe there's many different types. I mean, I'm a <laughs> product, but there might be ones that are really narrow around their feature and there's one that are more broad. So, and that way that I think that we cover both here anyway. Jason, do you see that similar? I mean, I hate to ask you the other question. Yeah, no, I think to be honest, as a product person myself, I'm always going to be keen on iterative, fast learning loops and stuff like that, because I think it's essential to make sure that you're not over committing or putting too many chips on the wrong part of the table. So, and, uh, you know, I can't speak for every product manager, obviously, but yeah. <laughs> I would assume that the vast majority of actual product managers, I think that the majority would feel like that. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that makes sense. But do you think that you touched on it like design systems and i know that in some companies like i interviewed one guy who's like he's a product manager for a design system so like they've obviously really mm-hmm. industrialized that but design systems feels like a real kind of settler or town builder type thing and not really like the sort of thing that you'd want to get involved in too much because it's not necessarily this kind of visionary thing it's more like the operationalization of design but do you think that design systems are essential for scaling UX and UI, or do you think you can kind of do it whatever way you want? No, I would disagree with the characterization. I love design systems. I think that, that <laughs> I think oh, you just want to build new ones all the time, but that's not well, <laughs> maybe, maybe. But I mean, it's, it's we're just talking about like visual design systems, like UI. That to me it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think you get generally all the pieces and parts ready, and you add to it, and you make iterative, and you you nurture and you curate that system, and you have a really good relationship with the front end team. That's great. I'm thinking, though, that repeatable pieces and parts of what we're building and what we're designing, what we're deploying for the features has to work at scale. And that's how you try to keep your company below a thousand people, because we can't just keep (laughs) hiring more customer success, more pods and more designers to do the client work. Right. So in the way that things that work should be repeatable. And um, I think if anything, the blue sky is where we blow it up. We take what we know and we do it in the next level. I think that that, uh, if you know what I mean, like I think the vision gets larger. If you piece apart these different, uh, and I'm, it's hard to have without using a specific example. I could probably use a specific example. <laughs> okay. So one thing that's so curious and exciting about Wonderkin for me is that it's a layer cake. We're designing and we think mostly from the customer experience first. And this idea of we deliver these experiences to these customers for these brands. Then we also have a UX, right? And we have like different product things that people log in and use. And so we're designing tools to deliver the things we design and and deliver. And so that is a really interesting interplay of repeatable systems where we can pick and choose and do it and have it at scale and then customize it and use it up to a point where it's the right for the customer experience. Well, those UX tools are the ones that need to deliver that and deliver that at scale. And so I'm, you know, currently we're thinking about instead of building a really great tool that designs an email, for instance, right? I have very little patience for that. It's like, I don't want to design an email. I'm going to design a thousand emails, right? And so to me, that's a different kind of design system, right? And so how do you do that at scale with where um, you're giving people simple but powerful tools? I think back to when we were at Bonobos, my, our founder and CEO and was the head of customer acquisition at, at that men's retailer. And just highlighting and understanding like he, as like a as a dashboard of things, of tools he could, and he could leverage if he, he was a smart enough guy, if he had the ability to do everything himself, he would, right? You're really looking to like kind of almost like create a system by which people can log in and really have the power at their fingertips to making these strategic decisions. And so I think a lot of what we're doing when we're building the design systems is to give all this variation and iterative potential within something that someone can like leverage very quickly at a much larger scale. And so it goes back to that. That customer experience, if we're speaking to billions of people, we're not going to individually hand make a million emails to send to them. <laughs> and so that's where the design systems come in, right? 
pieces and parts. I mean, we might like to think what we do and what we design is completely unique and like sniffling, but generally everybody's following patterns and trends and things. So we just tend to do them yeah. and probably productize them and organize them for reuse uh, at a much higher level with tens of thousands of you know, scales. That makes a lot of sense. But you're into performance design. Mm -hmm. What's performance design? Is it just the same as normal design, but more performant? Or does it mean something specific to you? Well, my senior director of customer experience uh, that owns that part of the layer cake uh, around like what we're deploying to what customers in, at scale and in to their individual needs, coined that in a meeting once. And I think it really steeped in the fact that when we were interviewing at the time, one of our junior email experience engineers, I asked a question in an interview, and this was years ago. And I said, what makes, what is good? What makes a good email? And it seems like a simple question, but how you <laughs> respond to that really tells you what you know about email, email technology, email design, whatever. Like, it's a complicated thing, email. Oh, yeah. And she was amazing. And she said, it's three things. And she said, it right about it. It's, it's how well it functions to your user. Like, does it get into the inbox? Does it look right? Does it look at all the different places? Is it, um, you know, and, and at scale, you know, you can reuse those pieces. So it's like the code, kind of like the, the syntax of it a bit. Then the semantics of does it meet the brand needs and, and does it, you know, is it communicating properly? And then the most important thing is she knew that the fact is it doesn't matter who you're sending the fart in the wind if it's not performant or it doesn't, it's not seen or used. Like, what's the point? Yeah. We at Bunderkin like to send less things. When we send emails to a whole list and group and, and such, it doesn't make any sense to send something to someone's not going to open or not going to use. So what we've been really good about is uh, in the ads as well. We have a beautiful ad platform. We're much more likely to send something that's higher performance that people actually get use of. They'll get and will know that they've converted on. And that's, that's the deal, right? We've saved a lot of money, saved a lot of people's time. There's so much crap out there that you see in your inbox or in online or different ads you'll never buy. It's just, uh, it's like visual noise. <laughs> and so the more you cut that back, the brand feels better, right? They, they didn't send more, as much crap out to people that don't want it. And generally you, you're speaking more directly and more specifically to the people that really want the messaging. And so. Yeah. So that's that performance design, right? That's so critical that you can have all three of those things. And I think that is different than what I thought about in the aughts when I did a lot of different websites and, and how to make it look and brand and communicate certain things. But I think it's also we're very blessed, blessed, maybe blessed is the wrong word, but we're very <laughs> uh, fortunate in the fact that at the scale we're working at, we definitely know what works just across the board, regardless of, you know, just generally we're doing it, you know, a trillion impressions at this point. So if we take that that knowledge and then we add customization for the brand or for the you know the individual uh, strategy and promotion, people tend to like those messages and those those campaigns much better, and they tend to be much happier. And the brands spend less money on sending crap, and ideally we're better <laughs> partners. And they we have more clients, and they sell more things, and the people that get them like the things more. And so those trillion impressions seem to imply that if you wanted to, you could do a bunch of different experiments as well. The kind of classic idea, like with Facebook or Google or whoever it was who change the color of their button by 1% or whatever and got all these different levels of engagement with the button. Like, is that the sort of thing you are empowered to do at your side as part of that performance design? Or are you kind of constrained by client demands and the kind of specs that they give you? We have a performance strategy team that's always running different kinds of interactions and things. They tend to be performance first, design second, and then like technology last. But they, they come at from a different angle. And it's like, yeah, we we're always iterating of how the web works in some ways. I mean, in some ways that we're the, we, we're the company that cursed everybody with these pop-up opt-in windows, right? Oh, geez. Yeah. The, historically, when we originally did that was when the right person wants to sign up for a mail, mailing list, we would know and we'd be able to trigger that for people. And they never see it again if they closed it. And if they chose to put their email in, that was a really valued customer. And then it got around that that mechanism was so intrusive that it was really powerful because everybody had to close it, that it became <laughs> something very different. And we're kind of cursed for that. But but the original thinking there was really correct, which is in the right time when someone's about to leave or whatever, you could say, hey, we know you didn't want to buy something right now, but we could follow up with you. Like if you were leaving yeah. a store at a retail shop, like, hey, make sure. And so the, 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 I think the heart, heart was in the right place. <laughs> and so in that way, we've, we've evolved. We've made those better. We've, we've always iterated not just what performs, but what makes a better long-term brand experience and a better partner for those clients. So yeah, we're always doing that. And we all are, right? Uh, Jason, you are as well, right? It, the, oh, yeah. The trends and inter interactivity moves on. But I, I'm real proud in the fact that when it was pushed down bars at one point, we, you know, when we had the Cyber Monday, Black Friday kind of coupon things and stuff, the idea of like creating new planes where people could interact differently from a site and bring it to life, I think was a good idea. And as we roll out different opportunities and different offerings for how websites or emails and such, 
that's what we look to is like thinking about how we actually truly use. So often what we do online is based out of the 90s of the first e-commerce shopping <laughs> experience. Nothing's really changed that much. I mean, outside of maybe, you know, Amazon doing Amazon, we could talk about that separately or, <laughs> or Shopify giving better payment or, you know, Apple Pay or something. I generally, it's the exact same e-commerce experience and we would just call yeah. it commerce experience. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to just keep iterating and think about how to do that very differently for the 2020s and not necessarily what we did in the 90s or in the aughts. And so, yes, we're iterating, thinking about that. And we want that to be a better, more seamless, a better experience with less friction that where the customer and the client is really happy with it. So when we're talking about building design teams, and you've described yourself as a pioneer, which is part of the classification put forth by Simon Wardley, pioneers, settlers, and town planners. And to paraphrase in my own words, uh, pioneers are out there doing all that blue sky thinking. Settlers are kind of going out and building it and scaling it. And town planners will then kind of take that and operationalize it and make it ready for prime time. So do you need an equal balance of all these types in a design team or do you kind of weight it in different areas? That's a great question. Pioneer, yes. And in the characterization of what that is, in meaning like, Maybe not blue skies, but like new and un- undefined, right? Like I, I, I do thrive in the new and undefined and high risk environment. I think that's kind of what you're characterizing. So I believe, and I even had this conversation with my colleagues in uh, research and development today. We're doing like an on site, off site kind of thing about 2022. And it's, there's different people in that room that live in different stages of maturity within what their platform, their product and what their involvement in the company is. And so. We sometimes speak different languages about that too. And that's, you know, maybe the example of people that work at big corporate structures really just looking for a really specific goal to meet. And that works for them. But maybe in startup stage, it doesn't matter if you met your goal or not. You you have to solve all the problems. You're the only one there, right? So in that way, I think the original question is like, how do you know when to hire people for those different stages? And identifying that, I think... Um, there's nothing more important in hiring and knowing exactly what individually motivates an individual and what they want from that now into the future. And so I've generally thought if it was something that I didn't have well defined or I was just putting definition to it, I would find that, you know, if I'm the pioneer kind of equivalent there, you find the settler person to make even more clear. And then those become your number twos, your lieutenants, your partners. And I have those people and they're amazing. And then they, they ultimately their job is to find that town's planner and really bring it into the space where it's well-defined, you're eking out performance, you're thinking about it really at that level. I can't remember the, all the adjectives raised on his, <laughs> his principles in front of me because I don't have them in front of me. But yeah, in that way. And so I think that what that means is to me is it also makes me feel really good where ultimately now we've built these teams enough times where I have these town planners where they do their job so well and they're so versed in it and they do it better than I ever could. And I can feel really good and like, wow, I'm not useless. I'm actually good at this part so that I can prepare <laughs> them. Now, if you find someone like that town planner, they get thrown into something that's very undefined and it's very high risk and not really good understanding of what the goals look like, they really struggle. Yeah. And to know what, and they, you can see the panic in their eyes sometimes, like, I don't know, that to me is fun. And it's a really cool opportunity and to, to figure out and to define and put shape into that. I think just going and thinking about it from those different stages has really helped me understand how to communicate to those individuals and know that we both have our own value and that I'm not good at some of those details and, and they are. And so that's, you know, they come in later. So I don't know if I know when those people are there, but I think that, that that natural progression has really helped me. Now, if you're naturally maybe this not a pioneer, you're a settler, that's okay. I think it's just identifying you might need that other pioneer person on your team that can yeah. that can define those R and D undefined things, or you might need a town planner, you might need these other people. So it doesn't mean that they have to come in that order. Uh, that just tends to be me. And what's one piece of advice you give an ambitious designer, maybe someone who's trying to get into performance design like you or just someone that's ambitious and wants to move on to the next stage of their design career, some first step that you'd advise any designer to go out and take and use that to level up their career? Yeah. So if we're talking about like really specific, like visual designers, maybe UI, like online, digital, those kind of folks, I think what's so exciting right now is, well, number one, I consulted for 10 years and didn't ran my own kind of thing. And I did engineering and technical things. I would say every opportunity you can to step in, to own something, to try something, to it's free sometimes to take on work where it's like, I don't know how to do that. And I think the intellectual curiosity of just showing up and saying, oh, I'll figure that out and not being too guided towards specific understanding of what you did in school or what you did your last job and such. I think just really open, opening the lens, broadening the approach. I don't know. Whatever. whatever. <laughs> we'll work that out. About like who you are as a designer. I mean, I, and the way I've used design in this conversation is very broad. 
And it's not just pushing pixels. It's, it's about pr- visual problem solving and thinking about things through in the same way that I imagine other people and other disciplines think similarly, right? Whether it's, you know, architects or whoever else. But that idea of that visual problem solving, I think that just opening that up and thinking about that. And then we talked about even like design systems. I think there's so many cool tools. So exciting to see what like Figma is doing as far as like you can work at all these different scales and you can push pixels and you can engineer and, and organize your thought in a way that's like at a many different levels. That's so cool. Kind of like harbors back to like like a different era of uh, print design where like people at different scale, like thinking about layout on a big giant phone book size thing you're designing, but then you also have to like design the individual pages. I used to work in publishing with magazines and stuff. <laughs> so like all those different scales of things and thinking about like narrative across different long... T- it, it's it's so cool right now that you can have those tools really powerfully and see it on many different levels. Our our design architect on the UX side is a specialist in creating design systems out for um, for Figma specifically. And just to see how he's using the tool to design for the tool uh, <laughs> is pretty cool. And um, I, I just think it's an incredible opportunity. I think just thinking about design really open and thinking about the visual problem solving. Also, I think like, you can't go wrong with just really going deep and studying typography. I think that's one of the best things I ever did was I studied like rigorous, old-fashioned, traditional print typography. And I think that's our secret weapon a lot of times is, <laughs> is visual organization, but also typography that it's, it's like a, uh, maybe you feel comfortable not Jason, but to me, that's like a, like a kind of a spooky thing that people that don't know how to do. I doubt maybe just re- going deep on color. I think my natural inclination of just studying color theory and such is another secret weapon. I think that just you can draw from as a designer that um, you can never know too much about, but is uh, once you know and understand, you see the world very differently can be like a really incredible secret weapon. So if you think about the three things I said, which is like type, which is kind of the communication part, visual organization about, I don't know, kind of how it looks, and then color and then how you can really express it in different ways. I think that, that you couldn't go deeper on, on any three of those things in any kind of medium and what you're calling design, right? Well, I'm a terrible designer, so maybe I'll just start with one. So where can people find you after this if they want to talk to you about design or performance design or any of the things that we've spoken about tonight? I think the best way any of your listeners would like, they can hit me up and email me, believe it or not. Richie, R-I-C-H-I-E, at wonderkind.co. We got the, the .com coming finally. It was in a, a German uh, bankruptcy. It was caught up for a couple of years, but the, uh, we finally got that. I tend not to have a big like public persona on, you know, on, on social media because <laughs> I think there's a lot of wasted effort that I put towards working at internally here. But Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I'd love to hear from people. So. And, and also, if this is something interesting to you and you think the right opportunity is there, you can obviously can apply. Um, we're always looking for great partners and good people So across our entire organization. All right. Well, I'll make sure to link that into the show notes and hopefully you get a few people come over and tap you up. Well, that's been a fantastic chat. So obviously, really appreciate you taking the time to share some of your thoughts and opinions about performance design. Hopefully, we can stay in touch. But yeah, as for now, thanks for taking the time. I loved it. Thanks so much for having me, Jason. As always, thanks for listening. I hope you found the episode inspiring and insightful. If you did, again, I can only encourage you to pop over to onenightinproduct.com, check out some of my other fantastic guests, sign up to the mailing list or subscribe on your favorite podcast app, and make sure you share it with your friends so you and they can never miss another episode again. I'll be back soon with another inspiring guest, but as for now, thanks and good night. <laughs>